Manx Radio Podcasts, powered by Shaw. Well, hello and welcome to another very Manx countryside here on Manx Radio, Kiri. Yes. This it's, the, uh, it's finally come around, uh, the, the Prime Stock Show, formerly known, of course, to us as the Fat Stock Show, but the Prime Stock now. Yes, it has many new classes this year and I went along to see who was doing all the winning and, yeah, lots of entries. Entries were well up and uh, nice to see a lot of young people there too. And some... Uh, keen interest in it as well because they sort of know the process of what's going to happen but they're keen to follow it and see what the people who are looking at them all are, are thinking or pointing at I suppose in a way and That's it, with the two sections it, you know, it can be quite daunting for uh, some people but to see them live and then to see them dead is a good it's good for the farmer to see and make sure that he's providing the right quality animal to buy in the supermarket basically and to know that he's providing the right one for the for the market and i caught up with a good old manxy ray kelly uh who a lot of the farmers and world will know quite well and of course uh from years ago at mull crease and now he's uh written a book uh called manx thalton volume one uh which talks about some of the old uh derelict buildings a lot of them now here in the isle of man that used to be uh, just out in such remote spots i suppose they, they didn't need electric or nothing like that no. did they as long as they had a bit of run of water and a a candle <laughs> keep good them enough going. for all them isn't it so uh, very interesting chat on that and also uh, you had a very Manx one as well you went along to the the uh, the group the Manx yeah. dialect group the new group formed by uh, Ned Kenyuk and John Dog Colser and uh, yeah they're trying to keep some of the old Manx words going and the, telling stories and, and recording these stories for years to come and yeah it's so interesting to hear some of the old words and their meanings and and just nice to hear a Manx accent. Yeah. It is. Well, here it is, you see. <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. Well, Kerry, we've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. And it's finally happened now, the, uh, the Prime Stock Show. Yes, it's certainly a good turnout this year with the new classes uh, of the baby beef and also the new classes in the sheep section. I went along to the ringside to see who was winning. So Jenny, you've had a very successful day here at the Prime Stock Show, winning Best Suckler in Show. Yeah, we're very happy with what we've done today. It's been our first time here. And with a limousine bull as well? Yeah, he's lovely. He's homebred by Will Large Gold Cards and Manana and Ivy. You, you're normally renowned to have charolais. Limousines are a different breed for you. This is quite a surprise. Yeah, they are. Um, me and Dad were talking and family meeting, and we decided that we'd try a different breed and keep our options open with what we breed. And a lot of work has obviously gone into this animal to prepare them for today. What kind of stuff do you have to do to get them ready? Uh, months and months of haltering, talking to them, handling them, walking them in and out of crushes, getting them used to different feelings. Just like basically a child, you got to start from scratch, get your confidence and then build into showing them. And you have a good bond with this guy here today? Yeah, they're all lovely, they've all got different personalities, different characters. You know when they're in a good mood, you know when they're in a bad mood and today he has been superb. And will he go forward for the summer shows now? He's only a year old today. Yeah, he should be about 18 months old by the summer show. Uh, he'll be in uh, prime condition, uh, hopefully he'll do us proud there as well. It's a great idea to have these baby beef classes at the Prime Stock Show. It's a new venture. Do you think it's worked? Definitely. It's given this bull particularly a lot of experience, being with other animals, being with other cattle, lots of humans, lots of noises. Uh, so hopefully it's done them the world of good. And you got reserve overall champion to put the icing on the cake. Was it a surprise? Very much so. We thought he would do quite well, but to get reserve out the whole lot, it's amazing. And he was against you know, a very strong class, and the cattle were a lot older than him. He was. He's only a baby, uh, but obviously he held his own. He's got a great shape, great personality, and he did it on the day. Emily, you're one of the competitors in the Young Handlers here today. How did you find your experience? It's my first year doing it, and uh, it's been really good. I really enjoyed it, and uh, it's a really tough competition, but great night, great night, yeah. Obviously, you had to take her into the ring on her own, you just, you and the beast. You know, is there a good connection between you? Yeah, I mean, she was a bit touched to start off with, but she was good when we got in there. A couple of incidents, but no, nothing too bad. And do you know what the judge was looking out for? Um, 
look them out for presentation and the handler and um, how you walk and how you keep a stance and stuff like that. Really. So will you carry on now and maybe have another go at Young Handlers in the future? Definitely, definitely want to have another go. Thomas, you won two of the new classes here today at the Prime Stock Show. Yes, we had two beasts here today, an Aberdeen Angus and a Hereford. They were in the native classes. It's nice to see a different type of beast here this year, away from the continental types. So they're easier fleshed, calmer temperament. Not many people like them compared to the continental, but they seem to be gaining momentum within the beef industry. They're just an easier handled animal. It seem to be they held their own up against it, winning the reserve overall steer as well. Yes, they do all right. Um, they, like I said, they're well fleshed, so they should hang up well on the hook. Maybe not as shapey, but you can't have everything. But they're, they're nice temperament, which makes them a better animal for a base cow. And will these animals be shown again? Hoping to bring them out again next year at, at a later stage when they're a bit older. They're a bit fresh this year. We haven't just spent that long with them. But if you can have another year of training on them, they, they should come out tip top, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Well, Graham, yet another win at the Prime Stock Show. A huge congratulations. Thank you very much, Kiri. Thank you. And what was it today? She was a blue cross out of a type of Angusy cow, so had a bit of good cover on her with good muscle as well on her. But she was very photogenic as well. She was really eye-catching and and she paraded really well too. Yeah, she was she was good in the ring. She um, handled herself very well. Philip was good to show her off. Willie was good to clip her for me. So it's it's always a team effort with me, like and my father and everyone else. The support I get, but. She was a classy little girl, that one, and she showed herself off. The blue and white was... She, she was a good girl. Yeah, but it's taken months to get to this stage, though, Graham. A lot of hard work and, and feeding, and you know, she was one of the older heifers here today. Yeah, she, she, it does take a lot of feeding, getting her right on the day and want enough cover on her, not too fat and not too heavy, and she's a beautiful heifer to work with and an honour to have her in me, with me. And I bet it was a bit of a worry when you went into that final lineup with all those limousine cattle and she was a Belgian blue with a, a limousine judge. Yes, yes, I was a bit worried when I thought he's going to be a limmy <laughs> man, but no, he must have the blue, must have took his fancy on the day and that's the one he wanted, so proud of it. For this heifer now, she'll go off to the the abattoir and we'll see on Friday if you can do the double. Yes, that's the hardest part is to see her go in the wagon. Um, she's been a good friend to me, but it's, it's a way of life. And um, yeah, we've got to see what happens on Friday. See, does she come through? Hopefully. Sarah, champion and reserve in the prime stock for the Continental Lambs. How do you feel? Oh, I'm delighted. It's lovely to win. But a lot of hard work goes in to getting these lambs here to this day. It does. Um, it all starts when you put the um, the top in with the sheep. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> a year ago, so yes, it doesn't all happen a week before the show. So these lambs today, after winning Champion Reserve, they'll go off to the abattoir and the same competition, the same lambs will come displayed in carcass form. How do you think they'll fare up? It's a different competition on Friday, you just don't know. They might do well, they might not do well, but that's the beauty of it. There's two competitions. And do you feed them any extra meal or protein to try and get them right for Friday? Some do, some don't, some are straight off the grass and some need a little bit of help just to get them ready for the day because that's half the competition, it's not just yeah. breeding them right, it's having them right for that day. And you've always got to do the same profile every year, you're looking for a lamb with a, a great top and good skin and great back end. Is there anything different you choose? It's more for the back end really and the, the fat class finish really as well. It's and got to be a three. And do you find a difference within the breed? And some will be leaner and some will be fatter. Have you got a mix at home that you know will put with the right top and that they'll come every year, the same mothers year on year? You do have certain mothers that will breed the right lambs for you. Christine, one of your last events, but it's been a great success. I think so, yes. There's certainly been a lot of people here this evening. But old farmers, young farmers, the, the house was full. Absolutely. I've, I've never seen so many people in, in Central Marts, but uh, everybody seemed to be really enjoying themselves. There was lots for them to look at. Uh, yeah, it's been a great night. And the new classes, I think they've been a roaring success as well, and it's certainly brought a lot more young handlers out. It has, yes. It's added a lot of variety to the show, which we possibly didn't have before. Um, we've got the breeding heifer classes, which was really well supported. And to see the, the young stock as well with the suckler calves. And to see all our own young handlers as well. That was really, really good. And our judge here today, he had a bit of a difficult task. He was spending a good few minutes, especially on that breeding heifer class. 
well, the quality was just amazing. I think everybody who, who saw the, the, the stock that was brought tonight was just amazed at, uh, at the, the, the high performance of, of the, the livestock that was here. Another great success for the Royal Manx Prime Stock Show. I hope so, yes. Yes, we're only halfway through it yet. We've still, still got the carcass competition on Friday. But yes, I think so. It's been a great success tonight. And Willie Kameen, he can uh, sleep well tonight? Willie Kameen is an absolute star. He's had a really difficult job tonight and uh, he did it really, really well. Um, and David Kane as well was judging the sheep. So, yeah, well done to both of them and thank them very much. That was some of the people taking part in the ring section of the Prime Stock Show. And next week we'll hear the second phase of the competition. It's, uh, I suppose, the new class is uh, trying to encourage more people there and the the chance for maybe some of the younger people to, to go and, and get involved with us and see what happens. That's certainly the case. There seems to be a lot more younger farmers bringing out younger cattle. They're easier to train and they can bring them out in the summer shows as well. So it's giving them a platform to go forward and, and it was great turnout and yeah, it's certainly going a great idea. Is it like that if you're used to obviously handling stock a lot, Kerry, but I mean, is it like that if you had a, a sheep or a, a calf that's a year or two years old and wanted to lead it round a show ring is that a lot harder than if it was six months old or so oh it certainly is the older they are they are a lot more difficult to train and it is essential to get them when they're only six or eight months old and you, you grow a nice bond a connection with them and they will pretty much do anything for you at a young age but when they're older they have their own mindset and we call them the teenagers actually and yeah they certainly are a, a bit troublesome <laughs> they get stubborn with their old age they do that right let's get on to my piece <laughs> I went to Long to speak to Ray Kelly, who's the author of a new book that's been launched here on the Isle of Man and worldwide on, of course, the internet. It's written and uh, put together by Ray Kelly and it's called Manx Thalton's Volume One. And I went along to speak to him to ask him where he got the idea from. Well, I was very friendly and have been friendly with a guy called Mike Goldie and he produced a book many years ago on Manx Thalton's. We were always going to update it. But he's not able to do it, so I took the plan on myself, really. And Mike Goldie, I think I remember that name from Max Radio a few years ago, was it? Ah, yeah, mm. he had the um, Russian Abbey Gardens. He also used to do a column in the paper, and he started the Southern Photographic Club, so he's uh, been around a while. But obviously you, you wouldn't want to do the same thing as Mike had done in the past, would you? Or was it a new project he was working on? No, the photographs he did were quite plain, and he wanted to always update them because he didn't visit them, so we had this plan to go along and just review the book and just add better pictures in to just change them. But he had fabulous information in the books, which made it easier to follow. Now, what sort of Fultons did he get to? Every one on the Isle of Man? There's no. only 10 or so? No, it's funny. I had a, an article in the paper a few weeks ago done by a fellow called Ed, and he said there's 2,000. Well, in fact, I don't think there are 2,000 Fultons, but there's probably 200. But I've only really concentrated on the farming ones, not the town ones or the ones that are, shall we say, fairly easy to get to. These are quite obscure, like Thulty Will and Baldwin, Laxey, Cornet, Russian Mines, Glen May, Glen Helen and uh, Round Ronick. So you've tried to get a, a variation of the whole Isle of Man, really. Yeah, and it's strange that when you go to these particular Thultons, they all follow a similar pattern. But as time moved on, they went from two rooms to four rooms and so forth. But unfortunately, most of them now are going to disappear. What about them in them the first times of the Fultons, the oldest ones that you've got in the book? I mean, and did they have proper doors, windows and things? I suppose they'd um, all have a fire. Yeah, the main thing in the in the old Fultons was the u- huge fire. You'd see two rooms, the fireplace would do an ox, be that big. And I suppose originally they wouldn't really have windows. They'd have sacks at the windows. They'd be very dark. Glass and stuff would have only come in later on. They never used brick, and they very rarely would have anything modern in the in the place. But this one, like said, my one that here at Jerby that we've done up, yeah. um, that was old beach stone sort of ones. Were a lot of them that, and I suppose the ones near the hills were were built by the slate and stones yeah. that were in the, the the northern ones were like where you are. They would have carted stones from the beach in a barrow sack bucket. It wouldn't matter because they're all round, and they would have caught them for miles. You know, just to actually build a house, it would have taken ages and ages. But they would have had the sand. It would have been easier to build because it's flat. And the hills, they use slate. And everywhere you go in these little places, you'll always find a little quarry somewhere where the stone's been taken out. And then they would actually fill it back in again. What about the ones that's left? I mean, they have seem to have been up for quite a few years, but are, are, they, are they safe? Well... <laughs> Not really. The safest one is in Balaf, in a place called the Point or the Pert. 
it's actually got a, a cement top along the walls, so it's been sealed. But when they're not sealed, most of those walls are infilled with soil, and when the top comes off, the water rushes the soil out, and then the walls just fall apart. So in the book I produced, there's two or three now that don't exist, so I couldn't go back and photograph them anyway. How difficult was it to go round and get permission for some of these? Um, Because now some of them on private land? Well, most of the ones in Salty Will and that area are on government land, so it's not so bad. You can walk to them, just beware of the countryside co, you know, shut the gates and keep your dogs in the lead and pick the right day. The other ones that are on private land is a case of approaching the farmer and saying, do you mind? And most of them are very affable and quite easy on it. It's just they want the respect that it is private property. The book's got quite a few thalts in it you can visit, and um, I've listed the ones you can see or visit and the ones you can't. But the book's that it's got a lot of stories in, and some that you managed to put in yourself, but there's a grain of truth in lots of them. But I suppose... It was hard to get information, was it, about them? Yeah, because the people who know about these, basically they're dying or dead or they can't remember or you're not easy to get to. There's nothing written down very much about these old ruins because they were never really sold, so the deeds to follow them through didn't exist. I mean, if we go into Salty Will, in some of the really remote ones in the early days, pots and pans and linen and bedclothes and coats hanging in the back of doors were still there. It just looked like one morning they got up and said, I've had enough, packed the bags, got the kids, and they walked down the village and never came back. It's just like that. And, of course, what would happen in those days, somebody else would take over the land and add it to their place, but there would be nothing done in a deed or a writing. So there's no way of tracing it back. You've got to really dig into history, censuses, and um, just do the research from people who are around the area. But everything on the book is hearsay, really, and very difficult to prove. And some interesting stories about walls being made of sheep yeah, skulls and things. Yeah, uh, <laughs> there's one or two places up north where, when I went into this particular Thalton, the yard was full of cow skulls which had been shot a couple of times, and then one of the garden walls had a numerous skulls put in to bolster up the wall, so you're looking at, like, the skulls of a cow. It's quite eerie, really. There's another place where a lady had contacted some sort of plague and she wasn't allowed to contact anybody so they shut her in a house till she died then there's the last man who got hung in the Alaman for killing his father he lived at the Cluggard so there's quite macabre places in the Alaman and some of them have got very nice feelings when you go through the door but some of them are quite eerie wow but uh, this is volume one does that mean we can expect another I mean how is People's reaction, you said um, you've got great feedback from it. Yeah, uh, did well, you do many copies? We did a thousand copies and it's been out about three weeks and the printer's suggesting that we need to do another one because it's not near Christmas, so he's going to produce another 500, I think. So there'll be about 1,500 out and there's about 800 being sold. So it's gone very well. I've been well received. It's on Amazon as well, apparently, and um, it's been travelling around uh, various places. So it's... Much better than I thought. You haven't got all the Thaltons in this volume, though? No, no. Um, I couldn't decide what to do because some of them were quite boring and just a couple of piles of stones, and I can't make much out of them because I've got no history off them. And some of them are very elaborate. So all I've done in this, I've just picked a few that I like from various places. And then volume two, if it comes out, will be the same. But there's probably enough for another one or two volumes if I have the time to do it. Well, finally, Ray, it wasn't all without his problems, though, was it? No, Getting to these places, they're, no. they're not always accessible. No, we did. I did have the odd um, exciting moment. There's one I do remember, which, looking back, was a stupid, stupid thing to do. I was in Glen Helen, and I wanted to go across the river in Glen Helen to cross up into Ely Bay, because there's a nice ruin up there. But I couldn't be bothered walking to the bridge. I thought, well, I'll cross the river, be all right. So I had my wellies on, slid down the bank, slipped on the first bank, in under, in the river, in the water, up to my neck. But I managed to keep the camera out of the water by hanging it up above my head. And I was thinking to myself afterwards, what a stupid thing to do, because I can't swim. And it was really deep, and I was frozen. Ray Kelly, tell me about his book, Manx Thalton's Volume 1, which is available in all the good and poor bookshops on the Isle of Man, uh, and, of course, worldwide on the web as well. And there's some fantastic pictures in that book to go along with all the, the details of uh, about all the, the Manx Thaltons that we have, just lying bits where people have probably 
who have walked past and never hardly noticed them before. Is there any around your area? No, there's not too many around where we are, but... Uh, All built on. Well, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it is nice that people are able to get out in the countryside and with the new smartphones, they're able to take lovely photographs and bring it all to life. And, and to certainly people that don't get out in the countryside much, you know, with social media and, and a book like this here, it's ideal to show some of the older generations that what beautiful countryside we do have. And it's sad in a way for me because... It would be so nice to see some of them done up like they originally were, you know, but of course people just want to build them like five bedrooms and everything, <laughs> which is nothing like they used to be, isn't it? That's, That's it. A trouble. lot of them would have been probably thatched roofs and uh, little stone outhouses. And they are quite nice and it's nice to see, you know, especially up in the Bride there near you, those now with the Max National Heritage have them, they've done them up lovely in their old yeah, old way. the way they were. And it's sad in a way that, that when you go into Harry Kelly's cottage, just for an example, or any of these old places, that you just go in there and that's what they had. Yeah. And it didn't matter. You went down the road, they had it. Yeah. Nobody judged. Isn't but it? nowadays, oh... <laughs> that kitchen must be two years old, isn't Keeping it? Keeping up with the neighbours. Anyway, before I get me high horse. <laughs> Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual. I caught up with Ned Genyuk to find out more about the recently formed Manx Dialect Group. I was getting concerned that our dialect was being mutilated, adulterated, substituted with political correctness and all that sort of nonsense. And I was afraid that our dialect was going to slip into obscurity. So I thought I'll make some sort of an effort to try and arrest the decline. So I was toying with the idea for a little while and I was talking to John Dog one day down at the Barony. He said, I'm friendly with the girls in Manx Radio in Women Today. And he said, I'll have a word on them. So we went up and spoke at length one afternoon with them girls and got an unbelievable response from the public. And that spurred us on to making some sort of a orchestrated effort into trying to preserve the Manx language and that's where we are and we were, we're growing in strength. Well you're certainly keeping the Manx alive here tonight there's lots of storytelling from different viewpoints the north is different from the south I found but lots of new you know Manx words like having a skeet what's fresh the cowl yes. and brock and yes. stuff that we use every day but it's, it's getting lost though Ned. Absolutely absolutely even among the Manx people you know I don't know like everybody's got their own take on it haven't they? The yard outside, the, what was the farm yard? We referred to it as the street. The same we, in our house still. Yes, we always referred to it as the street. You didn't have to think about it if you were told, you know, the cows is on the street. You knew exactly what was going on. And the dialect was only another form of communication that was prominent within the Manx people. And I think we should hang on to it for as long as we can. But you're hoping with this group now, Ned, the, the Manx dialect group, to, you know... Bring it all together, record the stories, record the language, how it's spoken and, and such like, for the next generations to come. Absolutely, that's the objective, to make sure it continues into the next generation. I've taught all my kids to how to milk cows by hand, how to thatch, how to build a stone. Well, they're not doing it now, but they know. And when they've finished building their own houses and raising their families, they, they'll know how to come back to it. And... It's not totally lost. These are old Manx ways of life, you know, Manx methods of how things were done. And that's right, that's right. You don't really get taught this in college. It can only be passed down from generations such as, or people such as yourself, maybe. A lot of it is not written down. A lot of it is not written down. We have to accept the responsibility that we are in possession of that information. And it's our duty to, to preserve it and pass it on. That's the way I see it. Do you think there's still a north-south divide? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> they always said at Ramsey Mart there was. Yes, well, I wasn't aware for a long time that Ramsey Mart was divided into north and south. There was a door going in either side of the scale and the north side farmers went in the north side and the south side. Now, what would have happened if there would a stranger got in? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. But, uh, but them were sort of things that, that were done subconsciously, not... Is anybody looking to see, am I going through the wrong door? It wasn't nothing like that. It was just like a cow that gets used to going into her own stall. 
<laughs> she doesn't know why she's doing it, but she does it. <laughs> but it's a generation thing. It was passed on from Absolutely. father to son. And Absolutely. But it's our culture and identity. You know, it's something we need to protect, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is what makes us Manx. And, you know, you're hearing people, the speakers out there tonight, saying how the Manx are, are recognised off the island. And, you know, that's really satisfying to think, you know, that we're 70,000 people here in... in you know, in in the big picture, we're nothing, nothing. but yeah. but we've still got our own identity, and it. and and that's good. That's yeah. good. Because once it's gone, it, it will be gone. That's Absolutely. the thing, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Yes. That was Ned Kenyuk from the recently formed Manx Dialect Group. Very interesting, and it's great that uh, a lot of people are, are getting involved in that. To keep not necessarily words in Manx, but the way things were spoken um, back in years gone by wasn't it yeah it's a really great idea and also there's some farmers and fishermen that still do speak the odd manx word but it's, it's very rare you don't, you don't hear it in the street anymore like you used to as a child you used to hear it quite often but uh, this group is is you know they're getting together and bringing out these words and recording great stories of years gone by and in that lovely manx accent you do you do miss it no oh, some of the words you've got to say because people always say you're talking so slow. We got to if you're talking in that sort of well, Manx accent style, haven't you? And I remember growing up on the farms when I was young when we used to ground all three or four different farms because they shared like spud harvesters and combines and things. So all the farmers used to go around and help out, you know, and they'd be always talking about the water and things like that, you know, all the words. It'd be cowl out tonight, wouldn't and, uh, it? And hack it. <laughs> the one we hear quite often is you're making a right brock of that we hear that at our farm quite often still <laughs> <laughs> well, people would say that about countryside some weeks <laughs> certainly yeah. Manx Radio's Countryside is brought to you by NFU Mutual they are books, dialects and cars and cows <laughs> very Manx isn't it yeah but uh, all Good, very interesting there. You know, we we'll try and bring a, a variation to countryside from week to week if we can. Um, and it's just so much local things out there that we can talk about if people are willing to actually talk to us, <laughs> isn't it? That's the hard bit sometimes. But it's nice to see that people are bringing these things back to life, the Manx accent, the, the Thaltons, you know, it's given them a, a new heart again, really. It is. might encourage some people to actually do them and maybe the plan and what have you let people just restore them to how they were i wouldn't like them seen done into big castles and mansions like i think some people would like to wouldn't they but it's lovely to see the thatch roofs again it is and not much thatch on my roof <laughs> <laughs> we'll leave it there for this week's countryside we'll be back next week with more so from me simon clark and me kerry kermode we'll see you then Ta-da. bye-bye don't sit in the slow lane join the fast lane right now with shaw's all new super fast plus broadband Enjoy more bandwidth, amazing speeds and the best value on the island from just £23.95 per month. So don't be left behind. Get a piece of the high-speed action with Superfast Plus Broadband from Shaw. For details, visit our stores in Douglas, Ramsey and Port Erin or click shaw.com. Love being Shaw. Terms and conditions apply.